We will now have a joint press conference of the Chair of the Military Committee, Admiral Rob Bauer, the Supreme Allied Commander, Europe General Chris Cavoli, and the Supreme Allied Commander, Transformation General Philippe Lavigne. Each military leader will have a short opening statement, and then we will take questions afterwards. Admiral Bauer, may I please ask you to take the floor? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon, and thank you for attending this press conference. Today we held a historic meeting of the NATO Military Committee. For the first time, we had the Finnish Chief of Defense around the table as our new brother in arms. Having Finland in the alliance makes us all stronger and safer. But this meeting was historic for another reason as well, because today the Chiefs of Defense discussed an unparalleled integration of NATO and national military planning. NATO is in a new era for collective defense, and it is an era that we are ready for. As the Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, said at the opening session this morning, the transformation of our alliance over the last decade, over the past year even, has been nothing short of remarkable. But we're not done yet. In the run-up to the Vilnius summit, we are integrating NATO and national planning more and more. And we are rapidly increasing the readiness of our forces. Today, Chiefs of Defense took stock of the progress made so far on the development of the regional plans and the new NATO force model, which will be required to produce more troops at high readiness across our alliance. Readiness and effectiveness is about much more than numbers. You need speed and scale as well as flexibility and a wide range of capabilities. Which is why we also address the requirement for strengthened command and control capabilities, which are linked to our new force requirements, which will set the number and types of equipment and organizations that we require across all regions and all domains. I will let General Cavoli provide more details on these work strands. But the main thing to, do, to note is that this process is ongoing and the fruits of that labor will be presented in a few months to the Allied Heads of State and Government at the Vilnius Summit. All our efforts are focused on making sure that the Alliance's political will is matched with military capabilities, which is more important than ever. Russia's war against Ukraine is the gravest threat to Euro-Atlantic security in decades. What Moscow hoped to be a three-day war is now entering its 15th month. The strength and determination of the Ukrainian armed forces and the Ukrainian people continue to astound us. Earlier today, we dedicated a special session to the military situation in and around Ukraine. The Ukrainian military representative provided a detailed account of the situation on the ground and stipulated the support that Ukraine requires to continue the fight for what is legally theirs. The Chiefs of Defense reaffirmed their unrelenting support. There is no doubt that NATO will support Ukraine for as long as it takes. Make no mistake, Russia will not stop at Ukraine. Its ambitions lie far beyond its borders. We have seen it with Abkhazia and the South as Ossetia, as well as Transnistria. Again and again, Russia has shook the foundations of the rules-based international order. And unfortunately, they have ushered us, NATO, in a new era of collective defense. Not just for Ukraine, not just for NATO, but for all free democracies in the world. The fundamental difference between crisis management and collective defense is this. It is not we, but our adversary who determines uh, the timeline. We have to prepare for the fact that conflict can present itself at any time. NATO has been preparing for this new era for years. 
The NATO military authorities have been monitoring Russia's pattern of increasing, increasingly aggressive behavior. Together, we have implemented the biggest increase in collective defense since the Cold War. But that work is not done yet. The integration of NATO and national military planning will enable us to do exactly what the NATO flag symbolizes. We will all follow the same compass. Ladies and gentlemen, the world has changed immensely in the last year. But NATO will do what it does best, unite, adapt, and protect. The determination and devotion of our 3.2 million men and women in uniform is unwavering. They are all working towards one common goal, the protection of the one billion people living on Allied soil and the democratic values we all hold dear. Together, they send an unmistakable message to any potential aggressor and embody an important truth that we are much stronger together than we are alone. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, maybe I could just give you a quick update on the implemented, implementation of the deterrence and defense of the Euro-Atlantic area concept, uh, strategic concept that we call DDA. As I stated um, in this forum back in January, the DDA family of plans is really the how of how the alliance will operate in peace, crisis, and war to provide for our collective defense. Um, the plans that come out of DDA, the strategic plans as well as the regional plans, these will drive our structure our operations, our activities, and importantly, as the chairman pointed out, our investments into the future. And this will include changes in our command and control structures. Um, the community inside Allied Command Operations has worked diligently over the past several months to develop sound, objective, defensive plans. And I can proudly say that we are on track. We are rapidly increasing the readiness and enablement of our forces and we're making sure that they are ready to face current as well as future threats. And uh, my colleague, General Lavinia, will talk about the future in a moment. Our regional plans are geographically oriented plans to defend specific parts of NATO territory. They blend national defense plans of our front lines nations into NATO plans. And this optimizes NATO's ability to move forces to the right time, to the right place at the right time. This change will move us from an alliance that was optimized for out-of-area contingency operations to an alliance fit for the purpose of large-scale operations to defend every inch of the alliance's territory, and this is necessitated by the new realities we face. Our strongest and most enduring advantage, however, will continue to be the unmatched unity of this alliance. The DDA strategy is a powerful demonstration of this cohesion, and it's designed to ensure our alliance remains strong, our citizens safe, safe and our values secure. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. So, ladies and gentlemen of the press, good afternoon. I'm glad uh, of this chance to answer your questions, but I want to start uh, with a few words about where we are and where we need to go. And we are fostering uh, the transformation of our military instrument of power to prepare us uh, for future challenges at the same time we, as we face the challenges of today. today. Today we are ready to support Ukraine for as long as it takes to defend its sovereignty and the territorial integrity. And at the same time, we need to prepare for the future uh, security environment. This environment um, is what I called the new reality. I describe this new reality with three words, more, faster, and everywhere. So by more, I mean more data, I mean more unmanned system, but also more hard power, more attrition. By faster, I mean uh, computing uh, power and soon quantum technology or hypersonic weapons that will require us to decide swiftly leveraging our assets in space or cyberspace, but also raising our connective superiority. And by everywhere, 
I mean that uh, these challenges are boundless across domains and theatres. Simultaneity is already a prominent aspect of the war in Ukraine. We know this characteristic will only increase and expand in the future. So, NATO must keep its edge today. Sacker talked about it. NATO must ensure it can deter and be ready to defend every inch of a light territory. But also, we have to ensure that we understand and are prepared for what may come tomorrow. And we need to do both at the same time. So how? Central to this transformation effort is to develop a multi-domain enable alliance with new capabilities that reinforce existing one. Hence, we need to implement our digital transformation. Hence, we need both quality and quantity with more and man system, highly efficient data-centric solution in order to link seamlessly sensor to shooters and sensor to decision makers. We also have to continue to embrace emerging and disruptive technology and the initial operational capability of Diana is essential in this regard. We are developing even more experimentation, wargaming, modeling and simulation. We have to leverage partnerships, starting with the commercial sector, especially in the area of digitalization. And finally, we need to improve our agility and our ability to act incrementally. So thank you very much, Win as a team, and I look forward to answering your question. Your question. Thank you very much. We will now take questions, and uh, we will start with Politico. Thank you very much. I'm Lily from Politico. I have a question for both Admiral Bauer and for General Cavoli. The question is, given this new era of collective defense with the new regional plans and the new force model, what is your message to the allies, the majority of allies, who still don't meet the 2% GDP target for defense investment? And do you think that it is feasible to implement the new plans in a situation, in a setting where not all allies meet the 2% target? Thank you. There's two different things. So first is that this, the, the, the regional plans and the four structural requirements that come out of it is basically uh, the result of thinking that started with two threats, which is Russia and the terrorist groups. And then we looked together at what do we need to do to actually deter and defend against those two threats. And the regional plans are a follow-up on the deter and defend strategy and it's more and more detailed per region now. So we know more and more uh, and in more detail what we need to do to actually be able to, to do that. And the next step then is, is, and that's the four structure requirements, is that as a result of those plans, you, we, we will now be able to define which capabilities we need in all domains, space, cyber, land, air, maritime, uh, to actually execute those different tasks. So, in the end, the alliance, if all the nations are collectively doing what, we, what they have agreed with NATO, uh, then we are able to, de to properly deter and defend those two threats. So, this is the first time that we have an objective way from the threat to the, to the investment target, so to say, of the nations. And I think that is a that's a big change. And I think that will help to convince the nations to actually do what they have agreed with NATO. But of course, if nations need more time or nations have less money or there's all sorts of things that happen along the way, then it will have an impact of reaching that ideal situation. So the uh, executability of the plans is the result of not only the investments, but it's also on the forces that, are, that need to be available in the right number and in the, with the right readiness. It is, of course, the command and control. It is the authorities for, uh, for the Supreme Allied Command in Europe. It is the plans in even more detail than they are presented and discussed today. And then, of course, it is the capabilities. So all that will take some time uh, to make sure that we get there. It is the result of more recruitment. It is the result of more training. It is the result of investments. 
And that will, whether we like it or not, will take some time. And part of that discussion is the money part, which is the, uh, the, the Defense Investment Pledge, which is part of, uh, of the Vilnius uh, Summit, where there is now a political discussion on how much will the – what will the def Defense Investment Pledge be? And, of course, there is a connection between what the outcome of those discussions is and all the work that we are, uh, that we are facing here with the four structural requirements. Chris. I had a very thorough answer constructed in my head, but the chairman, one by one, sentence by sentence, uh, covered everything. Uh, the only thing I would add is that um, I would emphasize his point that this is the first time in more than 30 years that we have an objective plans-based statement of requirements. And that's a real advantage for all nations in the alliance. It will give focus to their national defense planning uh, for collective defense purposes. So it is a, it is a very big advance. And, it, and if I may, I can just add that uh, uh, we are in charge to uh, to build this, this future uh, planning process in order either to integrate all the uh, the elements coming from the operational parts, the uh, DDA family of plan, but also the mid-term and long-term uh, uh, perspective, and we've got many imperatives to, uh, to integrate. Over. Thank you. Next question for Wall Street Journal. Thank you very much, Dan Michaels with the Wall Street Journal. A question, I guess, for all of you. Uh, a significant portion of NATO's forward posture now depends on pre-positioning of equipment. Uh, and one of the things we've seen in Ukraine is the Ukrainians have been very effective at targeting uh, Russian logistics and, and supplies. And I'm curious what kind of lessons you're drawing from the war, uh, which obviously might be a very different situation than what NATO would face, uh, but in your thinking about some of the logistics. And also on logistics, you're talking about a lot of things related to troops and equipment, but one of NATO's weaknesses that's been identified over recent years is the sort of atrophying of a lot of logistics within Europe, uh, things like train cars to move tanks and heavy vehicles, and the lack of knowledge of infrastructure in, in the former Soviet bloc members, just because it was not necessary until recently. So I'm curious how that um, less obviously military element of uh, your planning fits into all of this. Thank you. I'll start by saying that uh, for the military, logistics and enablement is a very, very important part of the thinking. And as you rightfully said, uh, I think over many decades we have neglected uh, the larger scale logistics that is connected to collective defense, a larger scale conflict, because that conflict was not foreseen. And we were doing out of area operations that were having a significant logistic impact, but it was much more planable uh, than uh, with a war that we now see, for example, in, in, in Ukraine. So this is also part of the discussion on making sure that we understand what we need, which is part of the four structure requirements, and then making sure that we start in a very uh, planned way to move towards executability, because this will not be a light switch. This is not something that happened overnight. This requires infrastructural uh, investments. This will require uh, investments in uh, logistic um, capabilities that we do not have anymore, as you said, carts on the rail or more trucks or whatever. All the things you need in a, in a, in a large-scale uh, logistic uh, war effort. So it will take time, and uh, we can talk about it very long that it isn't ready yet, and, and, and all the people will most likely agree with you, but I think it is important that we now are coming to the point where we all recognize and realize that we need to do this, and that is what is on the table now. Chris. Yeah, thanks. Um, first, your question takes us right back to the plans, of course. Um, the force structure requirement that Admiral Bauer mentioned a couple of moments ago is not just 
tanks and ships and fighter planes. A large part of it is the required enablement, the required logistics, um, equipment, units, systems, um, and so forth. Second, our plans are actually divided into two categories. One is functional plans, uh, strategic subordinate plans. Um, the other is the regional plans. The regional plans dictate how we will describe, how we'll defend a particular geographic area. The functional plans, which we call SSPs, those actually describe how we will do things theater-wide, how we'll manage assets and things. One of the most important of those plans is the SSP for enablement. And that's written by General Alex Zolfranck and his staff down at the JSEC in Ulm. And their initial plan is now going to be revised in detail based on the delivery of the regional plans. So they designed the framework. Now the regional plans have been delivered. Now they have the ability to go in and put the numbers and the exact quantities of transportation equipment and things like that uh, necessary. So um, to the extent that there may have been logistics atrophy, um, um, we have now got a roadmap to bring ourselves uh, back. And this is a very important part of the investment plan. Thanks. And, and if, if, I, if, if I may, um, about talking about transformation, uh, uh, logistic and contesting environment, of course, digital transformation will help us to understand f uh, better and to decide faster. So it's uh, very important, and uh, especially in, in the logistics. Um, the second point is that uh, uh, logistic efficiency is relying on host nation. We have uh, support, we, we, we talk about that. Uh, we are increasing uh, the way we are leveraging private sector also, and it's so important, and we can talk about uh, uh, the data where needs to, uh, need to be where they need to, uh, to be, and of course, Starlink uh, has shown us uh, uh, a lot of things in, uh, in, in Ukraine. I must say that also that the emerging and disruptive technology, technology has to be leveraged also. We can talk about uh, the energy and synthetic fuel, for example, but also uh, spare parts in logistics is very important, and we can think about uh, 3D, 3D printing. And uh, to conclude, uh, I think that, uh, of course, we have to continue to work on the mobility with the European Union. Thank you very much. Next question is for Reuters. Andrew Gray from Reuters. Uh, Admiral Bauer, in your opening remarks, um, you mentioned that this uh, war has now been going on for 15 months when Russia had expected a three-day war. Uh, can you say something about um, the impact of that miscalculation on the Russian military? In other words, how do you judge how much the Russian military has been degraded and depleted by this ongoing campaign? And do you think that the recent Victory Day parade in Moscow indicated that perhaps Russia is running low on some equipment and ammunition? Well, I think every party in a war will have similar issues, and that is that you uh, have casualties, that you have uh, uh, broken and lost uh, equipment, and that you are running low on ammunition. And I think that is on both sides happening. Uh, what is... Uh, uh, one of the miscalculations of, uh, of the Russian uh, operational or even strategic planners in the beginning was because they thought it was a three-day war, they um, forgot to inform a number of people in the execution. They actually um, didn't have their logistics in place. After a couple of days, they ran out of fuel with the tank army. That is not because they don't have fuel in Russia, but because they had it in the wrong place. So logistics is every war after, let's say, four, five, six days becomes about logistics. And that's what you see in, um, in, in Ukraine. And, uh, and that has a connection to other issues that we have as well, which is the uh, ability in your society to actually produce everything that you have lost, like ammunition, like new vehicles, like new artillery pieces, like new tanks. Um, let alone new people, but that's a different production uh, cycle. But, I mean, that is about mobilization and uh, about conscription and that sort of thing. So you need to find ways to find new people as well for your armed forces. Uh, but on the, on, the, on the 
on the materiel side, you actually see that uh, the Russians are now starting to use very old material, very old capabilities. Uh, the T-54 tanks that we now see in the battlefield, the T-54 the is actually related to the, 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 the year of design, 1954. But the problem is they still have a lot of T-54s. So it is still, in terms of numbers, quantity, it is an issue, uh, and I think um, that is what we will see now, is that the, the, uh, the, the Russians will focus, have to focus, on quantity, larger number of conscripts and mobilized people, not well trained, older material, but large numbers, and not as precise and not as good as the newer ones, and that the Ukrainians focus on quality uh, with Western weapon systems and uh, Western training. That's the big difference in the coming months, I would say. I, I would add that the um, degradation of the Russian armed forces is very uneven. It's predominantly in the ground forces, of course, which is why most of Admiral Bauer's uh, examples were probably from that. In, in other domains, um, the degradation has been much less noticeable. Very much. We have just a couple more minutes. I'm scanning the room. Yes. Can you please state your outlet, please? Elin Sarstal from TV2 Norway. Uh, Ukraine still asks for more weapon, uh, ammunition, uh, fighter planes. Uh, what was the message you could give to Ukraine today? It's a question for uh, the Admiral, but uh, everyone can weigh in. Well, actually, um, it wasn't discussed today, the exact uh, uh, amounts of things that, uh, uh, that Ukraine wants, because NATO is not the coordinating body when it comes to uh, the requests from Ukraine and uh, uh, the offers of the nations, the 15 nations. That is happening in the Ukraine Defense Contact Group organized through the United States in Europe. Uh, and uh, so that is not a NATO effort, and therefore it was not in, in particular discussed today. Did you discuss the fighter planes? No, we didn't uh, discuss fighter planes in, in, in that sense. So, uh, so, so the answer is no, we didn't discuss that. Okay, and then we just have one final question, Terry Schultz, Deutsche Welle. Thank you very much. Um, with your top two priorities today and in the new planning being Russia and terrorism, um, it strikes me that you haven't even mentioned China today. And one of the, the threats um, may be that while NATO is completely focused on Russia and terrorism, on refilling its stockpiles, on sending everything it has to Ukraine, that China doesn't have to worry about any of these things and, of course, um, can sit back and, and build its arsenal without um, any drain on it like this. So how concerned are you that, um, that perhaps you're focusing, um, I wouldn't say too much, but, but that you're, you're, you're not looking enough at what threats China may pose? And one of those threats is something that we never saw coming, um, for example, in Norway, where they're using electricity for a TikTok um, facility that, you know, that's something certainly a, a, a sort of infrastructure um, a hurdle that couldn't wasn't foreseen. Well, as you know, uh, NATO sees China not as a threat, but as a challenge. And uh, and th and the difference is when we talk about these uh, military plans, is that NATO is not working on military plans against China. We are working on military plans against Russia and the terrorist groups. That's where the plans are focusing on. That is where the four structure requirements are focusing on. That doesn't mean that there are allies in the alliance that also look at China and are planning on that as well. But that is not a collective effort uh, based on the policy decisions that was, take, that was taken by the leaders in, in Madrid. Uh, so that is, the, that is the answer to your question. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of what ifs in your questions, and of course, uh, uh, you can you can think of all sorts of uh, concerns with regard to China. But there, in, in terms of military threat, we did not have that discussion today. If 
If I, if I may, just speaking about strategic competition, uh, and I spoke about a little bit uh, uh, in, my, in my speech, so I think that the, the aim is to keep the edge, uh, NATO edge in uh, strategic competition. And the first thing is to understand better. So it's why we need this digital transformation. And uh, we need to share uh, more and more uh, data among, uh, um, among us and our partners. And uh, I will offer you the opportunity to read our uh, uh, very new, very, very soon, uh, non-classified uh, version of our uh, uh, NATO warfighting captain concept. Thank you all very much. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. We will end this pro, uh, press conference with one final statement from Admiral Bauer. Yes, um, I thank you all for your presence here in the room and online. And as we said, this new era of collective defense is not just about physically protecting one billion citizens, but also about upholding the democratic values we all hold dear. The free and independent press plays a big role in that. And you have an immense responsibility in the global quest for truth. By combating disinformation, you increase the resilience of our citizens. Yesterday, a French AFP journalist was killed by rocket fire in Ukraine while he was trying to tell the world of the plight of the Ukrainian soldiers. The price for truth can be immeasurably high. And I thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for challenging us. That is exactly how it should be until the next time.